Oh, it's uh, it's exactly this. Uh, it was a report that was put out um, at the request, at the behest of the uh, the then Chancellor, now the current Prime Minister, uh, which asked us to examine um, the case for action on climate change uh, and to do so in a completely independent manner. Um, and we did. We, we didn't have any predispositions on climate change. We came at this completely afresh. Um, we had some scientists on the team, but for the you know for for the most part we were economists, uh, and so we had to review the science as it was presented to us, and it's the science that uh, uh, that, that that drives the report. And what we found, and indeed what we found very very quickly when looking into the science, was that the cost of inaction, i.e., not doing anything uh, about climate change, would vastly exceed the costs of action, uh, and that was essentially the key message that we brought back. To the review, uh, and uh, uh, since then it has received um, you know, uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, publicity. Uh, at first, it was seen as a controversial position to take. I think now it's very much seen as a mainstream position to take. And indeed, if anything, the science has actually moved on to the extent that we probably underestimated the costs of inaction, some of the risks that we are uh, putting the world uh, to. Uh, but the story about the costs of action remains the same. We have the technologies where they don't exist. We can invest in bringing them about and set up the right policy frameworks. Um, the problem is not technologies. Uh, the problem is political will uh, and cultures and institutions. I mean, it was an economic assessment. Um, again, the, the economics is driven by the science. It's a scientific story. But uh, what we found was that the attempts to value uh, the impacts of, of doing nothing, indeed, and the impacts of doing something, uh, up until that point had been partial. They'd been very good, but they'd been partial. There are many aspects to the climate change story. Uh, it has impacts that go beyond just economic production, although that's important, especially in agriculture. They go beyond just the cost of building adaptive measures, you know, reinforcing seawalls, irrigation, water management. Um, they extend into human health, they extend into the environment, ultimately they extend into you know, potentially conflict, refugees, migration. Uh, if if you know, Bangladesh increasingly is underwater, if uh, big parts of uh, uh, Western and Southern Asia are faced with water stress and parts of Africa as well, uh, that will lead to conflict inevitably. So there's all sorts of human, environmental uh, and economic impacts that, that form part of the story. Also an important part of the story which hadn't been uh, addressed adequately prior to our review was the nature of uncertainty. Um, if there is a one in ten chance or less of a catastrophe, and the IPCC incidentally tell us that there is a one in ten chance of uh, temperatures rising by six degrees on average over the next uh, hundred years or so if we don't act. Six degrees doesn't sound like very much by the way, uh, but to put it in perspective, um, the last ice age, uh, the world's temperature was only four or five degrees colder, and, and you know, we would have been under an ice, a glacier here, uh, New York as well. Uh, the last time the world was you know, four, five, six degrees warmer was more than 50 million uh, years ago, well before humanity was, uh, was on the planet, a period characterized by you know, jungles and swampy forests and uh, alligators on the poles. Now, if we're going to see those kinds of temperatures over 100 years, it seriously compromises our existence as a species to exist on, uh, on, on, on our ability as a species to... Uh, it seriously compromises our ability as a species to exist on this planet. Uh, it will dramatically change the physical and human geography uh, of the Earth. So if we're talking about those kinds of risks, then uh, we need to value how we approach risk. We, we may be in a situation where the mean expectation is not so bad for some countries. It's bad, actually, for a lot of the most vulnerable parts of the world. But maybe for Northern Europe, North America, some of the richer parts, the average expectation over the next 100 years is not so bad. Um, but even we face a 1 in 10 chance of something utterly disastrous. So we took risk explicitly, and we addressed how we approached risk. Uh, and a lot of us care about low probability, high impact events. Uh, and so we actually quantified that explicitly in the review. The principle being um, a bit like your house. If you uh, you know you know that the insurance mon m m uh, companies make money out of you insuring your house, you know it probably won't burn down. But the chance that it may burn down uh, inclines you to pay a little bit of money each year to insure against that. It's very much the same uh, with the earth. If there's a small chance of something utterly catastrophic, then we may want to commit some resources now to prevent that risk.
The main conclusion is simply this, the costs of uh, action are dramatically lower than the costs of inaction, uh, and the costs associated with delay are very, very high. Uh, every year, every month that we do not act, the stock of greenhouse gases increases, uh, and therefore the work we need to do to meet any temperature level in terms of emissions, that's the flow into greenhouse gases, goes up. You know, these gases sit in the atmosphere for 10, maybe hundreds of years. Um, so every year that we put more, um, we actually have a, a harder work and a, and a higher starting point to, to address this problem from. And we also, every year that we delay, we lock into the wrong infrastructure. We build uh, high carbon power stations, high carbon buildings, high carbon road networks and so on. Uh, and so the earlier we start uh, building the right infrastructure, which will last for decades, and innovating and investing in the technologies and learning and experiencing the new technologies so that they become more productive and the costs come down, uh, the cheaper we'll do this. So that's the key conclusion. The costs of inaction are higher than the, uh, than the costs of action, but the costs of action will go up for every year that we delay. It, it's possible, and we did in the Stern Review, but on, on, the costs of, uh, on the costs of inaction, I would prefer to give you the scientific story that, that we said before. Now, we put some numbers uh, in terms of GDP, and we said that it would be equivalent to a loss of consumption every year of anything between 5 and 20% of GDP. Now, how do we get to that kind of level? Well, let me give you the intuition of this. I've said already that under the average expectation, the Earth will probably be 4 or 5 degrees warmer next century, with uh, significant but you know, small but, but non-trivial risk that it could be 7, 8, 9, perhaps even 10 degrees. According to the IPCC, right, this isn't us. This is the body of respected world scientists. They tell us that there's a 1 in 10 chance of 6 or 7 degrees, a 1 in 100 chance of maybe something like 10 degrees. I mean, we can't imagine what the planet would look like if it were 10 degrees warmer within the space of a, of a century, but it probably wouldn't include us, OK? So those are the kinds of stories we're talking about. To, uh, Try and quantify those stories as, as in terms of one, two, three, four percent of GDP, which some of the earlier studies did. And they did that because they looked at only some of the aspects, not the totality of the impacts. To talk about those kinds of effects in terms of, you know, percentage points of GDP when the world will be, under business as usual, twice or three times richer than it is today, simply doesn't make sense. We are really talking here about non-marginal, dramatic transformations uh, to the way humanity and, and indeed you know, other species exist on this planet. And they, it, just, it doesn't pass the sniff test to talk about those in terms of uh, a couple of percentage points of GDP. What we did is we took the science, we took the risks, we took some of the assessments that have been made already of the various uh, impacts, we aggregated them together, and we also accounted for the fact that we would want to value uh, increased certainty. Uh, and the numbers we came out with really do accord with the kinds of numbers you instinctively feel when you talk about five degree or 10 degree temperature changes. Um, we also used more recent science than reports that had gone before. Some of the economic studies were based on two degree temperature changes. That isn't what the IPCC the respected body of world international scientists is telling us is likely to be the case if we don't act. It's going to be significantly higher than that. So the difficulty lies not with the technologies, the difficulty lies not with uh, uh, the clear policy uh, uh, um, recommendations from the science and from the economic community. The policy tends to lie in the form of political will, in the form of uh, cultural, institutional and political barriers. We're seeing it change, uh, at, but it has to change further. Uh, it's only if we have the serious political will so that policymakers can give clear signals to business that the only future markets are low carbon markets then business will make the investment and make the necessary change and consumers uh, will also make the necessary change and find that you know, for a big part of that change, they will actually save money by reducing waste. And a lot of companies are picking up on that already. I, for example, work for Cisco, amongst other things. It's a company that is very active in looking to use information technology to improve um, the efficiency with which we undertake most of our daily activities by cutting waste, making sure everything is done more smartly, uh, buildings, uh, transport, electricity, uh, and so on. Um, uh, a number of other companies that are even more dependent on carbon, uh, we're talking here of companies like Shell or Toyota or Honda, um, uh, are also very, or GE in the United States, are also very active in uh, trying to uh, innovate in low carbon technology because they realize that their markets will disappear. 
Um, and if they're going to stay ahead of their competitors, they should find alternative ways to provide the essential uh, products that they are delivering, be it cars or energy. This can be done in a high carbon or a low carbon way. So there are new markets and there are new opportunities from the new innovations. And a lot of the businesses sensing that this is the way the world will turn and this is the way policymakers will turn are taking advantage of that. It's essential, sorry, it is essential that we put a price on carbon. Um, the activities in our daily lives that we undertake through consuming products and through uh, the processes of production of those products emit uh, carbon. At the moment that is, as you say, is free, so it's not reflected in the price, so we don't have an incentive to substitute out of those activities. It, it is vital as a first step that a price is applied to the damage done uh, uh, by a tonne of carbon on the basis of the estimated damage literally that a tonne of these gases produce, uh, taking account of how long they're likely to be in the atmosphere. Uh, but prices are not enough. Um, if price signals were enough, we probably wouldn't be as inefficient and wasteful as we are because we've already taken the steps to save money. So you need prices as an important first step to provide clear signal, and, and not just prices in one year, but a commitment to carbon prices well into the medium term to provide a clear signal to businesses uh, that there is an incentive to invest in low carbon uh, uh, products and technologies. But you need other uh, policies as well. You need regulation, you need standards, uh, as you've seen many times in terms of you know, standards for car emissions, standards for domestic appliances, standards for buildings. Uh, they improve efficiency and reduce, um, and reduce emissions. And you need support for technologies because even with a carbon price, it may be the case that the private sector is not willing to take the risk of investing in some of these technologies which have very uncertain long-term returns uh, and which others can copy very, very easily. So you need a broad range of policies, but pricing carbon, and, it, and not just in one country, but across the world, uh, at a comparable uh, level it, it is a key part of the policy response to uh, reduce emissions. Well, if we do nothing, again, the answer in terms of uh, quantifying the impacts of, of doing nothing are, 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 are difficult to measure. That's not a reason not to measure them because, you know, uh, one thing we are certain of is they won't be zero. Uh, one of the problems with a lot of the previous studies before the Stern Review was that they measured only the bits that they thought they could measure with certainty. So they measured impacts on GDP or they measured impacts on, uh, of events that are easy to project, like sea level rises. They didn't look at some of the more catastrophic events that are much harder to project and they didn't look at some of the impacts on things like the environment and human health and social dislocation. The Stone Review went further in addressing all these areas. It, it too didn't quite go far enough because there were some areas in particular to do with social dislocation that we found were just too difficult to put a number on. Uh, and we didn't want to be criticised for picking a number that didn't have a foundation. So we put a zero in. So in that sense, we underestimated the impacts as well, by the way. Um, but it, it's very much the case that if you look at the broad range of impacts and you account for the fact that you can't just look at the average expectation, you have to look at the entire probability distribution, including the possibility of low probability catastrophic events that the science tells us is a possibility and is something that we should expect. If you account for all of that and you put a higher weight on these catastrophic events, because as human beings we want to avoid catastrophic events, um, then the costs become much higher and they become uh, akin to something between a loss of uh, 5 to 20 percent of our annual consumption every year now and forever. That doesn't mean that loss will start straight away, but as a way of quantifying that loss, that's the kind of uh, numbers that we'd be looking at. In practice, of course, the generations in the near future will have less of a loss than the generations in the next 100 years. I talked about temperature changes of 5 to 10 degrees, perhaps, in the next century. That would be utterly catastrophic. Uh, that could leave GDP not only uh, cut by 5 to 10 percent, but it could actually uh, reduce it significantly more in future generations. Um, so, uh, you know, estimating the cost of this has to be done very, very carefully, and it has to be done in a way that describes the world in a clear and intuitive way, as the scientists tell us it'll be. It's not just a question about this or that percentage of GDP, because people don't understand that.